Best-selling Australian author Brett Priest has recently published his third book, The Unlucky Sperm, Tales of My Bizarre Childhood. It's a funny memoir, a collection of honest, harrowing and absurd accounts, and the book gives an insight into the reality of growing up as the odd one out in an Australian outback town. And Brett joins us now from Amsterdam. Goedemorgen to you. Well, goedemorgen and g'day. Yes, <laughs> I guess you've got two identities in a way. You are Australian, but do you know a lot of Dutch? I do. I've been here in the, in the Netherlands for nearly 14 years now. So, um, yes, I've picked up a few words. <laughs> yes. I can speak a few. I know, like, heb je een nushorn? Heb je een nushorn? Like, <laughs> is that a unicorn? <laughs> That's uh, do you have a rhinoceros? Oh, okay, I was close. It had a horn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not in my backyard. Happy A news horn? <laughs> Nay. Nay. <laughs> I've been having a Dutch lesson every week for 14 years now. Wow. Still struggling with it. Still have a constant sore throat um, from trying to pronounce all these uh, <laughs> words. But uh, I'm getting there. Yeah. And I do. I, I have, but I'm still Australian inside. Yeah. yeah. I still, I'm still a bush pig from the outback of New South Wales. <laughs> <laughs> so just <laughs> in Beijing, Nederlands. Yes. I'm Beijing, Nederlander. Um, and I'm Beijing. Well, and also I'm Beijing, Japans. I lived in Japan for a couple of years. Wow. I'm Beja Dotsa, which means I'm a little bit German. I've lived in Germany for 10 years. So, yeah, I've traveled a bit since um, the outback of Australia, since my time there. Yeah. yeah. So what's it like growing up in the outback of Australia? Because as a Brit, I maybe have this image of it being quite isolated. Is that true? Absolutely true. Now, um, I'm not sure if you've heard of the town where I, where I grew up. It's called Broken Hill. It's a mining town, and it's uh, not right in the middle of Australia, but it's in the outback of New South Wales, close to the South Australian border. It's very isolated. The nearest city is six hours by car, and uh, and that will get you from the top of um, the Netherlands down past Paris. So, um, yeah, it's quite so, so it's not like you can go anywhere for a quick weekend away. <laughs> so you're very isolated. And also growing up in the outback at, at, during that time, I grew up in the 60s. So my childhood was there. It was in the 60s and the 70s. And my book is based on that time. And because it was isolated and I was this little boy who just wanted to be creative and I really had to try and conform to the miners' culture, the macho culture, being sporty, yeah. and um, also being Catholic in a Catholic school. They were quite strict. Um, I had other, I had other ways of, um, yeah. I have, a, I had other needs. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to dance and sing and be create and perform, and that wasn't my town at, yeah. during the sixties. I think it's all changed now. It's a lot more cosmopolitan. People now know where it is. I guess is it still quite isolated though, because it's something mm. insane. Like ninety percent of people in Australia, or something like that live down the coast and in the big cities. That's right. I was riding the heat waves in the middle of Australia yeah. <laughs> growing up. Like, it was very, very isolated. And we didn't go away very often. So, yeah. But at the same time, I don't want to trash Broken Hill. It was just my experiences. Going back there now is an incredible city. It is more cosmopolitan. And because, um, you know, people, um, it's kind of like people go there and make their own fun. So yeah. probably all the same, same the same thing in the in the UK that if you're an isolated town um, that you tend to make your own fun you don't have a lot of fun to go to like lots of musicals theatre and opera and so on so you create your own fun and that's what I did to try and cope yeah. with all the harrowing stuff that was going on around me the town is called Broken Hill and is that what it's actually called or is that some kind of affectionate name because <laughs> It just seems so random. No, no, it is actually called <laughs> Broken Hill. And I actually do outline that in my book, um, how that all started, just a little bit of history of it. So it, uh, yeah, it's a mining town. And a couple of hundred years ago, there was a guy called Charles Rasp, who, did, who was an explorer. And he went from Adelaide, went up north to try and see if he could find silver or gold. And he found on a range in the outback, a crop of, of um, hills and rocks, he saw something shining and he thought it was tin. And uh, when he went and took a sample of it and sent it back to Adelaide, to the laboratory, they went, no, it's silver. And wow. so, and he said, well, I just found it in a broken hill. Like he actually broke the hill and, <laughs> uh, and the mining started there. So, yeah, that's how it started and became one of the richest actually in the world for silver, lead and zinc. 
So, yeah. Um, yeah. And so my dad was a miner. Uh, my brothers were miners. I was for about a day. <laughs> <laughs> I realized it wasn't for me. I was like getting my hands dirty. <laughs> That's insane. Only a day. Because yes. in an isolated place like that, is there more of a kind of maybe family tradition where you're going to do what your parents did, whether that's being a farmer or a miner or something like that? It was the tradition and it was the expectation, especially in the 60s and the 70s, because even in the 60s at that time, women, married women weren't allowed to, allowed to work. And so mum couldn't work. And so the tradition was that the boys um, would always go to school, get a good education and so on. And then you'd go on the mines. And it was quite a good job at the time in terms of um, the money and so on. But people didn't have anything to spend the money on. So they would just spend on alcohol. And it was like a pub on every corner of the town. And um, so... Yeah, that's what was expected. And that was what was expected of me. And leading up to that, you had to be tough to become a miner. So everything in your childhood was sort of, you were being primed to do that. Become a tough person, be sporty, um, be one of the men so that when you go and be underground that you and mine, that you would be sort of, yeah, sort of conform and be part of that, but not me. (laughs) I had other ideas. And you, of course, grew up gay in this isolated mining town. And then an isolated place like that are people maybe less accepting because it tends to be in rural places maybe without bashing them they maybe take a while to catch up it took a long time and yeah to say the least it was really really difficult for me and that was of course in my teens the book the unlucky sperm that i wrote which is tales of my bizarre childhood actually starts from sperm from when i was conceived and up until i was about 17 until i left to go to university and um so the early part of my childhood i had no idea i was gay but i was doing i was doing everything that wasn't typical of the things that boys were doing in that town i didn't like football I didn't want to, um, I wasn't into sports and I just wanted to be creative, but I was also in a dysfunctional family. And so there was a lot of alcohol, a lot of domestic violence and so on. And everyone, and that was quite common. And I didn't know that um, until later. And then, um, so I, I was channeling my energies into things that were creative to try and cope with all this, all these expectations around me and all these harrowing things that were going on. So I was getting into music and, uh, sewing and crocheting and knitting and so on and i'm not sure whether that made me gay <laughs> <laughs> i don't i don't think so i actually do believe it's in, in genetic yeah and then um when i became a teenager yes as i discovered that mm, yeah i'm actually attracted to guys that made it really difficult being isolated like that because it was very hard to find anybody else who had the same feelings or yeah. was in a you know in a similar situation so i couldn't wait to get out of that town to try try and find my kind yes <laughs> where are they <laughs> and so um when i was 17 i managed to and i outlined it in the book to get a scholarship from the mines which was amazing and uh headed off to university and that was that was incredible i just, just a whole new world opened to me but again i'm saying too that was in the 60s and the 70s and yeah. a, a big surprise about broken hill now which is incredible it, over all these years it's become a town full of artists musicians wow. It even has the biggest uh, drag queen festival in Australia once a year. Yeah, called Broken Heel, Broken Heel, H W E L S. And I thought, what? It has that now? Yeah. You know, 30, 40, 50 years later. But it, yeah, and every time I go home now, it's quite incredible. There's, yeah, there are a lot of gay people. There are a lot of, it's very diverse and cosmopolitan now. Yeah. But at that time, which is why I wanted to write this book, was just to talk about what it was like going through a difficult time in isolation with a dysfunctional family. And some people, when they read it, might have a few tears, but my main goal was to see that I used humour and music to cope with all that adversity. Yeah. And if all this stuff that's happening in Broken Hell now existed when you were growing up, what impact do you think it would have had on you? Oh my gosh. I Well, actually, I probably would have just stayed. <laughs> <laughs> Like, wow, this is great. (laughs) No, but I, and yes, and that is a really good question, Tony, because your situations in life make you who you are, don't they? So I couldn't wait to get out of there and explore the world. I thought there's got to be more to life than this, surely. And um, there's got to be a great sewing machine somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) Someone who just loves fashion and music and so on, and theatre. So when I got to university, wow, that that was amazing because it was on the east coast of Australia. 
And I just couldn't believe that there were boys playing music and um, dancing and and uh, creating and being themselves. And then once I explored the East Coast, I thought, wow, there must be more to this as well. And then that's when I started my journey of going overseas. So I went to Japan, I went to Germany, Ecuador, and here I am in the Netherlands. So if I didn't have that, probably that, you know, those awful experiences or those tragic um, times, then it wouldn't have really spurred me on to really be where I am today and had the life that I have had, which has been amazing, just been quite, yeah, quite yeah. an adventure. And the book is called The Unlucky Sperm. Why is it called that? And why is the un part in brackets? Good question. So it, the un is in brackets at the beginning. So it raises the question to the reader before they read it. Is this about a guy who was a lucky sperm or an unlucky sperm? So I wanted to put the un in front of it, not to, def- not to define that I was unlucky, but question it because we are all lucky sperms once we reach, we're the first ones to reach the egg and be yeah. conceived, aren't we? Yeah. But then once we're born, depending on the environment that you're born into, the family that you uh, are lucky or unlucky to have, um, or your situation, then that determines whether you are a lucky sperm or not a lucky sperm. So my question to you too is, do you feel like you're a lucky sperm? I guess so. I won the race anyway. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, yeah, that was a good start. We I made it to the uh, egg first. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, and so that's why I called it that, because I wanted readers to think as if they were reading, oh, is this guy, was he lucky or unlucky? And of course, because it is a funny memoir, there were tragic things that were going on in my life and um, in my childhood with my family and so on. But some people read it and say, oh, that was unlucky. That was a terrible thing to have happened. But I actually turned every lemon into a lemonade, every situation that I could. Wasn't wasn't exciting and happy at the time. And I think there was somebody who actually said once that comedy is tragedy plus time. And I think, you know, you just need to have a bit of space and distance from a tragedy to be able to then look at it and laugh at it if you can. And that's the, me- that's the message of my book, is that to give people hope, um, because I talk about a whole range of sensitive issues in the book. Every chapter is a vignette. Every chapter is a story on its own. And so um, they cover a whole range of things from Catholicism, domestic violence, being gay in an isolated town, isolation, a whole range of things. And so uh, it res- it has resonated with people from various um, parts of life. You know, people look at it and say, oh, yeah, I experienced that as a Catholic kid. Oh, yeah, I experienced that with domestic violence. And so the message is, yeah, well, you know, you can survive that and you could probably rewire it if you look at it with humour yeah. and try to laugh it on so that it's a tool to help you move forward. Some people can't and they might, be, they might end up becoming the unlucky sperm because they end up becoming miserable for the rest of their lives. But my goal is and my goal and I was determined to try and turn those lemons into lemonade and say no well, I'm going to use humour and music to help me cope which I did as a kid and I still do today and this is of course your third book so are there yes. plans for a fourth and even more absolutely um, there is a sequel to this one and I'm writing it at the moment because I have been a lucky sperm in publishing it and it's doing really well <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, it, and this particular book goes up until when I was 17 when I left home there were a lot more bizarre experiences since then yes. as a young adult in my 20s and yeah. 30s. And still today in Amsterdam, I'm having some bizarre experiences. <laughs> Doesn't everyone? <laughs> so there are... <laughs> yeah, there's a book there, uh, many books, many books to follow. So, yeah, I hope. Excellent. Well, where are we able to find your book, The Unlucky <clears throat> Sperm, if we want to read it? Where? Yes, you can definitely get it on all Amazon platforms, whether it's in the UK or American, like Amazon. Uh, You could even just go to your local bookstore and ask for it and they can order it for you um, because it's, yeah, it's registered as a published book. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, lots of different media platforms. Uh, like in, in uh, I'm just trying to think of the ones that you might have in the UK because in the Netherlands we have one called Bold.com, but they're all connected to Amazon. So the main one would be Amazon.com, or in the UK would be Amazon.co.uk. Just type in the Unlucky Sperm, and uh, you'll find it there. There's an audio vo- uh, an audio version, an audio book version. There's an ebook and the paperback. And the audio book I would like to promote because I was so lucky to get Miles Pollard who. Was is a well-known Australian actor, 
And uh, he did the audio book version for me and he nailed it. It was just so good. He got the accent, the, yeah, really conveyed the whole um, story. It's, it's great. So if you want to hear a story on the way to work and listen to it, <laughs> get, get the audio book. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you, Vale, for coming on today. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Your Dutch is amazing, Toby. <laughs> Dewey. Okay, thank you, Vale, and da. <laughs>